Now, he starts out, or did you not know, right? And a lot of people, they just, you know, we got to make sure we get this, this whole context here. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he says, or did you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. You like the covenant. Okay, so that means, right, the individual, you live your life, and then after death, the judgment, so that the law, the covenant, you, it's only while you're alive. That's kind of the point, is that it governs your alive time with God. And then he compares it with a marriage. And when we see marriage comparisons in Scripture, in the old or the new, it's God describing these certain aspects of relationship. But look how it's different with the new covenant and the old. Mm. Oh, it's good. The law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband, the covenant of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so she's not an adulteress, even though if she marries another man. Okay, now this, and look at, Paul is setting you up where you aren't going to be able to walk away. You're going to be like, oh wait, no, but that's a great, excellent point, Paul. Thank you. He was saying, he's describing this sort of covenant, a marriage covenant. And in a marriage covenant, if one person dies, then the other one is free. The other one is free. Think about that. Therefore, my brethren, you have also become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Mm. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So he's showing that this covenant, the old covenant, is like marriage. When one person dies, the other's free. And in this covenant, when Jesus died, the other's free. That's his comparison. And when he's bringing up this thing of the adulterous marriage, we, know, we remember that from the old covenant, where he's saying serving other gods, doing other things, is like this adultery thing. It's like cheating on the thing. And in this case, that's what we're talking about here. But it's not cheating, exiting the covenant, not abolishing the law or something like that, right? Mm -mm. It's fulfilled, so it's gone. It's so good. But now we have been delivered from the law having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Remember, the newness of the Spirit, the newness of the Spirit covenant, the covenant of the Spirit that brought the Holy Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter, the law, the written. We were delivered from the law, delivered from the covenant. Yes, delivered from sins, but because the, the reason how we were delivered from sins was because we were delivered from that covenant that no longer exists. None of it. Again, in whichever ones we want to take where we know it's morally bad, we just put that, we don't put that in our new covenant bowl of, you know, candy. We put that in the general sin candy bowl, you know? And then when we do that, then... We know what's not to do, but we don't make it our righteousness or our justification, or we don't think it interferes with us and God at all. Mm, it's so good. My goodness gracious. If you, could, if you could really love this righteousness you have, it's like it's everything God wanted for you so that you and him could be like this. It's so good. So we continue. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? And that's sort of the idea. It's like, wait, if it's sin and you're rescued from sin and the law, then was the law sin? He goes, certainly not. On the contrary, I wouldn't have known sin except through the law. 
For I wouldn't have known covetousness unless the Lord had said, don't covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. He's saying, look at even seeing it up there, seeing it say, don't do, made the body notice it and want to do it. And now what I was doing, now it's sin because it's written there in the covenant. And then it says, for apart from the law, sin was dead. When there wasn't a law there, it wasn't a sin. He says, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Because sin is death. And the commandment, which was to bring life, the Ten Commandments, the Old Covenant, that what he experienced, I found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment, by the written rules, by it being there, sin took occasion by that, deceived me, and it killed me. Because sin equals death, wages of sin is death, compared to eternal life, right? Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. So what he's saying is like, look at the, the covenant itself wasn't bad. It was how me and my humanity and my flesh and my mind responded to it. And the, what it did showing the difference between the standard of the stipulations and what I was actually able to do. Right? So, so and notice this when this comes, he's not sitting there saying, oh my gosh, I love sin. I can't stop. He's saying that because of the covenant was there saying it, you can't help it. But it's all with the grace knowing that that covenant is not there anymore to do that to you. It's amazing. So he says, so then has what then is good become death to me? It's like, so I said that the law was good, but that the sin was bad. But now does that mean the law is the same thing as sin? He's like, certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what was good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So the sin in the human, the weakness, the mistakes, the errors and stuff, because of the law, it kind of magnified it. It put a magnifying glass on it and it was like, oh, wait, you're right, yeah. And then the knowledge of it and the conscience of it and the thinking of it produces more. So he goes, verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, spiritual in origin, but I'm carnal. I'm human, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. He doesn't understand it in the spiritual sense. Like, and he's, by the way, remember, he's taking this position of here's what is like the flesh doing it, trying to keep up compared to the old covenant, right? So he's not sitting here saying, in my life, I don't do what I want to do. He's describing this idea and the, he's answering the question of, is the good law bad sin? <laughs> Right? So remember that. Because a lot of people, this verse, they'll use this to put all kinds of condemnation and sin on you and all these problems. And it's because they don't have the new covenant idea and they're not reading it in context. Because look, he goes, look at, for what I will to do, I don't practice. But what I hate to do, that's what I do. If then I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's good. But now it's no longer I who do it, but the sin who dwells in me. So he's saying, look, there's a difference between knowing the law is good and it actually sin being produced because of the law and then recognizing the turmoil and struggle within of the standard that's impossible to match. But the answer isn't try to be better for the standard or the standard is great. He's saying, nah, -uh, like the new, here's what's coming later because the wages of the very sins that that good law shows equals death. And that's his point. So he goes, if I, you know, I do what I don't want to do, verse 16, I agree the law is good, but now it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present within me, but how to perform what is good, I can't do. He's like, so within me, I want to do the good, but I can't find within me the way to do it perfectly. And again, this isn't, you know, his daily struggle. He's talking about the old covenant forced you to be stuck in that kind of scenario. So then he goes, uh, for the good that I will to do, I don't do, but the evil that I don't want to do, that I practice. Now, verse 20, now if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin who dwells in me. So he's going to look at my mind, my heart, want to do whatever. The spirit was willing, but the flesh is weak sort of idea. And that was a problem with the law, right? All the Jewish people, David, everybody, all the Israel, they weren't all evil. Some of them were, but a lot of them wanted to do good, but couldn't. And that was sort of, that's why we're talking about here. So he continues on. 
And this is why God is so good, because he saw this dilemma and didn't put more rules and more restrictions and more ways to make it tougher. He made it easier by faith and grace. And that's why Jesus is so good. And that's why this new covenant thing, it, it not only sets you free from all that stuff, it sets you free from bad teachings about this stuff that you heard from some grumps who don't have grace and don't have love. It's so good. So he goes, verse 21, I find in a law that evil is present within me. So in the covenant, the evil is present within me. The one who wants to do good, it's in there. He goes, for I delight in the law of God according to my inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He's saying this captivity to the law of sin, right? Which is the old covenant, the law of sin, which is, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death, right? And some people will say, that's right, that's you today. Who can deliver you? But they still think that it's a daily process. But if you're delivered, it's not a daily process. If you're swimming and your boat capsizes and you're on one of those lifesavers, not the candy, and you're just cruising around and then you're like, oh, great, I got delivered and saved. Guess what? The next day, you're going to be like in a warm bed, not floating around with sharks tickling your feet. Being delivered from it is what he says. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What? That they will be delivered from the body of death. The physical thing of how that sin, that able to not be perfect, then would result in death, that Jesus does it. Then he says, so then with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So in this covenant, in that law of sin, he's like, I want to, I want to do good. I know it's good. But in that covenant, in the flesh, I can only do, I can only do that. It's, it's laws to break. And I do it. So this, thank God, who's delivering him from that body of death, the death part of the body, which can't help but sin, and it's affecting his righteousness and justification. Then he goes to verse 8. We all know this one. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, remember what we're talking about here. A lot of people get this wrong. They'll say, well, you know what? You're a Christian, but you're walking according to the flesh. Well, you could use that terminology in saying that, yeah, okay, someone is sinning. And, um, and you could say that that's the flesh that's doing that. Okay, got that. That's cool and stuff. But notice what he's talking about here. The flesh and the body is the part that can't fulfill the old covenant, the law of sin. And remember, the law of sin and death is the old covenant because it's where sin equals in death. The wages of sin is death in the old covenant. But the gift of grace, Jesus Christ, our Lord, eternal life, blah, blah, blah. So remember, these are the comparisons. So when he's saying there's condemnation in that other law, why? Sin and death. Death is the condemnation. You are condemned to die. That's what we're talking about. But those who are in Christ Jesus, who aren't trying to do that old covenant walk according to the flesh, which he mentioned, the people who are still trying to follow that, still doing the circumcision kind of idea, that he's not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And again, remember, Holy Spirit is the part and parcel with the new covenant, right? We're not saying, this isn't, he's not saying, my spirit within me, it does good, but my flesh is bad. So I will not walk with the flesh, but with my spiritual hierarchy. No, he's talking about these, new, these two different things because Jesus Christ and what he did rescues him from that sin and death. And look, we see, for the law of the spirit of life or the life-giving spirit, right, of the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus, that law, that covenant has made him free from the covenant of sin equals death. For what the law couldn't do, in that it was weak through the flesh, because you couldn't be perfect, it was weak through the flesh that he just described that kept doing the wrong things, kept sinning. The covenant was weak because it could never be fulfilled because it was due to the flesh. The law couldn't because of the weakness of the flesh, not the weakness of the law. Remember his thing? He's saying, is the law sin? No, it's the body that's sin. The, the flesh responding to the law was the problem. So he's saying that what the law couldn't do, that it showed us, was that it couldn't make the body and the flesh stop. It couldn't get you to a place where you could earn your own righteousness, which would have been following it perfectly. But that's what Jesus did, right? So it was weak through the flesh. What the law couldn't do with the humans at the time, law, weak through the flesh. God did, verse 3b, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, for sin he came, and then he condemned sin in the flesh 
And how did he do it? That the righteous requirement of the law, which is perfection, the requirement of being perfectly righteous, right living, might be fulfilled in us who don't walk according to the flesh of that old covenant, but according to the spirit. He condemned sin in the flesh, in his flesh, the same flesh temptations that Paul was talking about. Jesus had those same temptations, remember? He condemned that in his flesh that the righteous requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us. The requirement of the law, which was to be perfect, obeyed, that it would be fulfilled in us who couldn't do it perfectly. But, and it's because it can only be fulfilled in us if we're not walking according to the flesh, trying to do it on our own, trying to obey the old covenant because it's not there. But we do it because we're walking in this covenant of the Spirit, the Spirit, living according to the Spirit. Like, and then look at these verses all make sense now. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. If you're thinking of the old covenant, you're thinking of what sins not to do. Sin, sin, sin. Don't do this, don't do this. You put your mind on that. But those who live according to the Spirit put their mind on the things of the Spirit. Verse 4 there. It's, you're putting your mind on the new the things of the Spirit, the good and not the sin stuff. And then look at verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. This flesh living by the old covenant is death. Sin equals death, right? But to be spiritually minded, minded of this new covenant of the Spirit, is life and peace. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost, eternal life. All of these things that are new covenant specific. So he's not saying, well, you're a Christian. Well, guess what, brother? You're sinning right now. You are carnally minded. You are walking in the flesh, my brother. No! You are if you're trying to, if you're basing your righteousness on works of the law, which is the flesh, which is the thing that goes, ah, I want to do, but I can't. In the new covenant, I want to do, believe, and I can. And then now I'm not walking according to that law. I'm not walking according to the flesh. I am walking according to the spirit, which I got in the new covenant only. Then it says, look it, so because a carnal mind is enemies against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. The carnal mind, the natural mind, the flesh in the old covenant is against God, and it can't be subject to it. It can't be like perfectly doing it because, and, and it can't be. He's saying you're even trying to do old covenant. You can't. It's impossible. So, so he says, so then, verse 8, so those who are in the flesh can't please God. Now, we know elsewhere, you know how to really please God, actually, and it would be by faith, right? But notice what he's saying, that if you're doing it to please God, if you're trying to follow these rules and laws to please God, if you're doing old covenant stipulations, if you're trying to put the Ten Commandments on your courthouse to please God or something, nope, doesn't do it. You're in the flesh. If it's covenant here, right? And we got to separate this idea from, it's like, okay, we see that there's covenant ideas of flesh and spirit, and then there's general. So yeah, if you're stuck in the same thing and you're getting free from it, you're struggling with it, whatever, they may be in the flesh. But these verses are not talking about that because that's actually, you know, like that idea of how to address and get free from sin and get healing so that you can is addressed elsewhere. But that's not what he's talking about here. But so many times people just see a word. Oh, I see flesh. You know what? I'm going to preach that to my brother who doesn't, he's having some sin in. It's like, dude, no, you're missing the whole thing. And ideas like that, we pull verses out. We don't read it in context. We miss what he's saying here. And within the new covenant is the solution that we need. It's the solution that we want, but... If we take in all these verses and mean different stuff, then you and me, if we've been Christian for a long time, we've been in the game a long time, then we're going to look and be like, oh my gosh, like I read this verse. I'm just going to skip right past it. Oh, wages of sin is death. I know that verse. Oh, this verse. I know this verse. Oh, I'm in the spirit. No condemnation. I know this. And we just zoom right through and we think that looking at words on a screen is the same thing as it affecting us or building us up or feeding us. And it's not. It is to the degree that you understand it and pursue it and study it. Be a good Berean. Be a good, wise steward of the mind and intellect God gave you and, and love this and get into this because this doesn't mean, this cuts out a lot of bad doctrine, but it also opens up so much opportunity for growth and the promises of God, right? Prophecy, healing, miracles, supernatural, everything in this new covenant lens is so different. It's so fruitful. It would take the amount of books that would be written. I will not be able to write, maybe audio books. Anyways, so look at Verse 9, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Okay, now look, how many times have we heard this verse preach something else? They go, because at first it says, don't be in the flesh, it's seemingly, right? 
We have this idea. Well, I don't want to be in the flesh. I was in the flesh, brother. Ooh, I got it on fleshy. I saw a commercial with bikini mamas and pizza, and I got it in the flesh. I was fasting, and I, you know, no, dude, look at. You're not in the flesh. He's telling them, you are not this flesh thing we just talked about up above. All these other chapters about the flesh and about the mind and about that stuff. He's like, you are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. The spirit side that I described, all the spirit stuff, that's what you're in. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now we might say, well, what do you mean if the spirit dwells? He's being... He's doing a figure of speech saying this. They know the Spirit of God is dwelling in them. They're working in miracles. They're, preach, they're speaking in tongues. Every Christian, as soon as they got saved, they'd be like, hey, you want to get the Holy Spirit? Sometimes they would sell salvation. They'd be like, hey, look at, um, see these superpowers? You can uh, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you could receive the Holy Spirit. They're like, yeah, of course I want to do that. That's awesome, right? Like, so he's telling them, look at, same with the Galatians. The Spirit you received. He goes, look at, the Spirit of God lives in you. That can't happen under the old covenant. If you're in the flesh, then the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that was promised in the new covenant, He cannot be inside of you in the old covenant. So the person I described above, the sadness, the Romans 7, the scariness, my flesh, and all this stuff, that ain't you here. Because look at in the new covenant, the victory over sin is not struggling not to do it. The victory over sin is knowing that it does not hold anything over you. And you and God are together unbounded. And no matter what the devil could slime you with or confuse you with or make you feel bad about 2,100 years ago, he can't today. That's the power. And when the last enemy defeated is death, this is how Jesus did it. We take a lot of these future verses because we say, well, people are still dying. You go, the Messiah in Daniel 9, he put an end to sin. Well, people are still sinning. You're missing the whole point. They're missing the whole point. Sin no longer has dominion over you. Death is not the end. Eternal life. That's this idea. So he's saying, look, at you are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So then he would say, they, they, they would respond. Oh, well, well, yeah, the spirit of God dwells in me. Look at Blah, 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 and they just throw it out on some tongues, right? So then he says, look at now if anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he's not his. Now what's he saying there? Is he talking about people who don't have the spirit? No, he's talking to the people who have the spirit. It's, he's, look at this is a clever dude, all right? And I think a lot of problem is that Paul is clever and a lot of preachers have great hearts and great spirits and great emotions, but they're also not clever. And they preach some of these wor words in the weirdest way. He's saying, look at He's like, if the Spirit of God is in you, then you're in this spirit thing that I'm describing with no condemnation, with none of the law stuff, none of the flesh stuff, none of that. And then he goes, and if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. And, and to early Christians or me or you, if you have the Spirit, we would say, oh, well, I have the Spirit of Christ and I'm his. It's reinforcing this new covenant truth. If you're his, you have his Spirit. And if you have his Spirit, then you are not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit. And then he says, look at, and if Christ is in you, and we say like, which he is, right? So we just got to turn our brains on here and listen to his argument. And if Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin. That body we were talking about, yeah, it might be dead because of sin, but the spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from, your, raised Jesus from the dead, his physical body, the mortal body, look at this. This is big. You've never heard this before, but it's so clear here. He's saying, okay, you got the spirit, he's in you. If you don't have the spirit, he's not in you. And they'd be like, okay, I do have the spirit. And he says, well, if Christ is dead, then even if the body, if Christ is in you, then even if the body's dead, your spirit is alive because of righteousness and the spirit in you is alive. You go, okay, yes, that's true, Paul. And then he says, but even if you think your body is dead, your physical flesh, sin, that body that you're not a part of, but even if you think that's dead, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, right? If God, if the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. We've heard this preached in so many ways to, that it means like in heaven someday, he'll give life to our mortal bodies and we'll have immortal bodies. That's true. That's not what this verse is talking about. 
We might have heard this is about physical healing. Well, look, if the Spirit raised Christ from the dead, then you could have physical healing because His same He dwells in your mortal bodies, and your mortal body is the one that needs healing. That is true. That's not what this verse is saying either. Because what's his argument? What's he talking about? In the law, in the old covenant, the flesh was dead and the spirit alive. The flesh was dead because it could just sin. It couldn't get redeemed. It couldn't. But he's saying, look at your spirit. You got the spirit in you. He's in there. He set him up. He's saying, look at you got the spirit and you're his and he's guaranteed in you. Right. And they're like, yeah. And he's like, and you think your body is dead because we just described how the body does the sin and the sin breaks the law and it's the body and it's the flesh. That's the the tough thing. That's kind of crappy. Right. So you feel this big void between the two, which a lot of people still preach. But then he says, but look at guys, if the spirit of him raised Jesus's physical body from the dead, then That same problem you have with the flesh, that same problem you have with the body, that same limitation of the sin, uh uh-uh, he will give life to that part of you, the mortal body, through his spirit who dwells in you. And this is the idea of God putting his spirit in the new covenant within, and then you'll know his judgments and do them. He's not leaving them hopeless here. He's telling them, hey, here's where you put your focus. Here's where not to. Even though you got this flesh, that ain't the end because you know it with the spirit inside you. Then he's also going to bring the same life to that that he brought to your spirit. This ain't about somebody, I'm living, I'm in the flesh today. I'm in the spirit tomorrow. There's terms and ways you could use that with other scriptures that might make sense. But that's not what he's saying here. So look at, look at what we're talking about. And I love, look at sonship through the spirit. These are not, you know, The titles are not, you know, they added those. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes they're confusing if they didn't, you know, depending on when they were written, they might have the wrong idea. But look at, so he says, look at verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors. We owe, we are in debt, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. He would say, therefore, right? So what he just talked about, since the spirit will give life to our mortal bodies, even though the flesh is dead, even though the flesh is sin, the spirit gives it life. So he says, therefore, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. And again, he's talking about the old covenant thing, right? Sin equals death, the old covenant. Not today, though there be ways that that would be true. He's still talking about new and old covenant. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In this new covenant, you are putting to death that sin thing. You're dying to sin. Death, deeds of the body, you will live. 4, 14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Indeed, if we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. Do you see what he's saying here? By the Spirit, you're putting death, the deeds of the body. This isn't a live holy thing. This isn't a don't sin thing. When you're in this new covenant, you become, you are being dead to sin, no longer the slave. It is nothing to you. It is not in your mind. Your mind is on the Spirit. Spiritually minded, life and peace. Carnally minded, flesh, all that stuff. And again, remember, just to say it again, as we all, me and Paul and everybody has to, we're not saying don't avoid sin or we're not saying do sin, obviously. But if you're focusing on something, that's usually well, well, that's what you're going to focus on. And then he's talking about being led by the Spirit of God, by this place and position you're in. Then you're the sons of God. Now, this term has some different history. I'll talk about another time. It's fantastic. But he said, look, it, you didn't receive the spirit of bondage so that you would fear again. Because remember, the old covenant, that was bondage. You were a slave to sin, to the rules. It was on your mind. The devil could just use it to make you feel bad and then hate people who preached at you and all that stuff. And then you would be in bondage and then you would fear death. You would fear separation. But you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So the slave idea, right? The slave would be the one in bondage. But the spirit... And the adoption thing is now you're being a son and not a slave, right? This is the idea. So then if you're a son, then the spirit, we say father, not like master, like a slave type of thing in this analogy. But he's saying like the spirit, we get the same spirit of the son. So then we also say the same thing it said through Jesus, which is father. And if children of God, the Sabbath father, we're the children, then we're heirs, 
heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now here's doing a little bit of shift of suffering, but notice here that now he's kind of leaning into this life thing. And he's, he's kind of coming to the end and doing a little transition in his ideas. But I hope you've seen this, this covenant aspect of this flesh and spirit thing. It is, if we don't see that, if you don't allow yourself to kind of look and just study and get word by word with it, there's a million things that you could think. And you'll end up thinking more old covenant, more sin focused, more sin conscious than ever before. But with the right new covenant understanding here, it, you just get Paul's argument so well. And then when you have that understanding and you're hearing, then all of a sudden now your heart and your spirit is open enough to be able to hear from God the real stuff. Well, what's the stuff I need free from? How can I get, I can be free now, finally. Because look, at, if you have no hope that you're ever going to be free of something, then you're probably never going to be free of something. But the problems or lack of information or whatever it is, that hope is like, hey, I can be free. And this new covenant is full of hope. The old one wasn't. It was sin and his death. But this new one is the hope of the glory of God. Mm, 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 so good. So then he mentions verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, the sons of God and creation, some would say creature, you know, waits. It's basically saying, look at the whole world, all of creation was waiting for this new covenant time where you're no longer slaves or whatever, but your sons, your family. And you have the same spirit as the son of God and you're in. And nature, creation waited for that. Because why? It was subject to all the ills of humanity. Because humanity did all their ills, not just like on the floor and stuff, but everywhere. It was like, you know, so we see. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So even the earth... Right? Remember the same things they would see in the sky. They'd be like, oh, the story is there. Even earth itself was excited. Now, some people thought, oh, this is some future thing. Maybe there's a new heavens, new earth. He's being poetic here again. He's saying, look at that, that creation was waiting for this thing that he said just previously already happened, that now we are children of God and we're sons of God in the spirit of adoption. So that's now. This is now. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Not only that, but we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Now, there could be an aspect, a lot of people would put this in the future, but remember what he's talking about, the redemption that happens and the adoption, it already happened. So this, in this way of saying that we ourselves grown within waiting for the adoption redemption, imagine this as the state before you receive it, right? So that even as nature is waiting for these sons of God and real to happen, so is the physical body, mine, yours, theirs, before they got it. So it's like nature and all creation can't wait for this final culmination of what God promised. And then he says, 24, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is, not, hope that is seen isn't hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But we hope for what we don't see, and we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So there then he's leaning a little bit on some of the future, maybe redemption idea things, or almost the idea as if maybe adoption also has a future principle. But remember the idea that sort of like with inheritance, while you're alive, it's still an inheritance, even if, you know, the inheriting didn't happen yet. And so in the same way, if there's an aspect where when we pass on, that there's a different idea of adoption that doesn't change the fact that now we have this first fruits of it. We have this down payment of it. We have this redemption now that it's, that it's begun. And that's what's exciting. So then he goes in 26, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses. So he's talking about the hope and the things through the, the problems, the, you know, the, um, what is he saying? The sufferings and stuff. Then he says, likewise, the Spirit helps in our weaknesses. Now, here we go. This is a thing, a lot of Spirit-filled people get it. 
a lot of people think it's other stuff, but when we just understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit and what they believed then and the biblical experiences of praying in tongues, which is languages that you don't know unless you interpret it, things like that, then this makes sense. Likewise, the Spirit helps in our weaknesses. For we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. We can't pray the perfect prayer. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, some will say, oh, that's a quiet thing. Some people say, one time I prayed and I just went, mm, and I knew it was the Spirit. Okay, it could have been. But here, what are words, human words that you can't say and speak, but the Holy Spirit prays through? What does that sound like? Oh, yeah, exactly like tongues. Thank you. Um... <laughs> And then he says, now, he who searches the hearts knows what the minds of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So God, the one who knows, searches the hearts, who knows the stuff that we don't know, who knows our heart, knows the Spirit, Spirit in us, knows what the mind of the Spirit is, the Spirit praying through us, praying with us, because the Spirit, he makes intercession for the saints, prayer, intercession for the saints, right? What? According to the will of God. Every time you pray in tongues, you're praying according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit, obviously, if he's with you in prayer and you're doing that, he's not going to pray something like, oh, maybe it could rain tomorrow. No, he's praying the will of God for you, for your family, for your health, for your friends, for your enemies. So do it. It's awesome. It doesn't have to be out loud. It could be quiet. It could be in your mouth. Do it. Because it's prayer always according to the will of God. And a little bonus in James and John, it says, how would people expect to get their prayer answered? Or the only prayers that they would expect to be answered are prayers made according to the will of God. You know what that means? Every prayer you pray in tongues gets answered. If the Bible says that the prayers that get answered are prayers prayed according to the will of God. Mm, it's so good. It makes you just want to pray in tongues. And then we go 28. So we got the Holy Spirit praying, him praying according to the will, things that we can't utter and say. And then he says, and we know all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Some people take this verse out. They're like, this means everybody. Everything's going to work out okay. Well, look at what he's just talking about. The Spirit helping, this adoption, this praying in tongues, this according to the will of God. And then it says, so all these work together for good for those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Some people are still on their own purposes or not pursuing God's purpose. It might not be exactly that verse, right? Then look at, for whom he foreknew, us, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, which is what we hear about with the spirit of his son and that walk in the spirit, not the flesh, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Jesus, with many sons of God, many brothers, joint heirs, Moreover, whom he predestined, which would be us, and which he's talking to the Romans, right? So remember that some people are like, what about predestination? Does that mean he didn't predestine some people? Paul is not saying how God picks people to be saved here. And that's the biggest problem. The context of the argument, this has nothing to do with salvation. And if you think every time that you think something has to do with salvation, that's pretty much the whole message of the non-spirit-filled old covenant world. It has just everything salvation. Dude, salvation is an open door into the things of the kingdom. And look what he's saying here. He's not talking about predestined to salvation. He's talking to, Paul is writing to people who are already guaranteed saved. They have the Holy Spirit. He just talked about them praying in tongues and stuff, right? So then he's saying, like, that all the things that's happening, it's working for the good, according to the, for the people, according to his purpose, right? And these are Christians he's writing to, so they would be like, okay, that's me. I'm on. We call it his purpose. And then Paul is encouraging them, saying this to them, because who God foreknew, again, them, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, which is like what he's talking about, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, right, them, so he's like, he predestined you guys, because, you know, you're there. And then he also called, so he's now bringing this idea of them being called also, that if God put it there, then those are the same ones that he called. And then the ones he called, those he also justified, which is made righteous, right? They would get this righteousness. And if someone says, well, aren't all called? Well, look at if this verse is saying that anyone that God called, that those are the ones that he justified, then that means anyone in the new covenant who receives this righteousness, this justification, then they're called. So if you're saying God chose it, it's like, no, God chose the covenant. You choose to get in it or not. And then look at those he justified and whom he justified, he also glorified. 
So remember, he's talking to Christians here. He's not doing some salvation. He's, he knows the people he's writing to. He's encouraging these Christians. So if we read this and like, oh, Paul is just sitting in some thing somewhere, writing a dictionary definition of how to get elect salvation predestined. No, that's how he's doing it all. Because look at, he continues in this conversation that he's having. And that's how we have to see these letters. It's a conversation. He goes, what then shall we say to these things? Right? We got the flesh thing we don't have to live by. Then all the trials and troubles, which are okay, because they produce this hope. And then the Holy Spirit helps in our weaknesses. And then we have all these awesome things. He says, so what do we say? If God is for us, then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. God decides who's going to bring that charge. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died. Christ had that condemnation, so to speak, the death. Who's condemned? Christ died and furthermore is also risen. And who's even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He's interceding. He's playing that middle part. This doesn't necessarily mean this idea of intercession, like he's sitting there praying. Okay, this word intercession is interceding. It is being that mediator. And it'd be awesome if he did. But I'm just saying, you know, like this, when we look at the scriptures, we don't just take one word that's been translated and we think that means the way we use the word, right? We kind of see. So it says, it says, look at 35 then. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? As it's written, for your sake, we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And remember the context here. Yes, that's true for us to say now God loves us. But he's describing that the love of God through what Jesus Christ did and what it can produce, and how that is in contrast with the last chapter, where the sin and the death and the failure and the negativity is the focus. But now in the new, it's this. Back then, death could separate. Back then, the temptation, the problems, the issues, those did separate. But now in this, no, because of the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, the covenant bringer, the covenant fulfiller and covenant mediator. He's so good. Romans 9. I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Look at that. Can you hear his heart? Like, in, after comparing and showing the old and new and the difference, and how the people at that time are still so stuck in the old and even persecuting him and others in a terrible way that he's saying, look at, he's like, I'm telling the truth. His heart is breaking and yearning for his Israelite, his Jewish people to, that he said that, he, that if he could be separated from Christ, a curse from Christ so that they could know him, he would do that, right? This is like a heartfelt passion thing, which no doubt drove, you know, his... I mean, well, knowing his history, especially, but so he's saying that, look at that these people, these countrymen, according to my flesh, like my fellow Jewish people who are Israelites, who to whom pertain that they get the adoption, the covenants, the giving of the law, the promises, it's all for them too. But they don't get it, you know, and he's like, and I wish I could that and, and from whom, according to the flesh, that Jesus even came from. Who's over all. So he's like, guys, he's like, I wish, I, I wish they could be saved, right? So then he continues on. But it's not that the word of God has taken no effect. Because they're not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they're the seed of Abraham. But it says, in Isaac, your seed will be called. 
that is, those who are the children of the flesh. These aren't the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works that they did, but of him who calls, of God's choice, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. And as it's written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So first he's saying, look at God's promises of this restoration and fulfillment, these old covenant promises, and people still make this mistake today. It's the biggest error in end times theology and all this stuff is that they see these promises to Israel and they think that they are still in the future now. But if they were ones that had to do with either following certain stipulations, including stipulations of the new covenant and everything, then what we will see is that he's making this distinction because what he's saying is God has, God's word hasn't failed here. It hasn't taken no effect because the ones that are the real seed of Abraham, the real true ones that he's talking about, true Israel here, and he's talking metaphorically, obviously, are the ones by faith because Abraham's promise came in and it was by faith. So then the new covenant people, and I don't care about some replacement idea. There's nothing to replace. All, stip, all ideas of nations and nationalities were cleared out. The board was cleared and it was reset with individual people, no matter where you're from, in covenant. It ain't replacing nothing. It's a new world. It's a whole new world. You know what I'm saying? So when he's saying this, and then he's using these examples of this seed of Abraham of people of faith. So if someone were to say, well, I thought that it said that Israel can have this and it hasn't happened yet, so it must be in the future sometime with my other poorly thought out end times scenarios. You'd be like, no, look it. When it comes to this covenant thing and the salvation and the faith and the grace and stuff, he's t this is what he's saying. Now, you can disagree with Paul if you want, okay? Start your own thing. And some people, because they trip over this with the old covenant mindset, they have. There's some Christians that are like, I'd rather have the words of Jesus. Um, I don't like Paul. It's like, dude... Jesus, by his spirit, just as he promised, spoke through the Holy Spirit. Remember the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. It's Jesus talking that Jesus then was the one who communicated by the spirit with Paul, with Peter, with James. And when the Holy Spirit talking, speaking through, revealing these things in the new covenant, using scripture, using understanding, using this thing, that is Jesus speaking through Paul. And no one is saying, oh, Paul changed some people. You know, there's a lot of silly ideas. It, and all of them don't understand the covenant, don't understand baptism of the Holy Spirit. They think, oh, Paul was sent in to change the religion because it was supposed to be just a little more Jewish. It's like, no, dude, what are you talking about? People say, oh, well, Christianity and Judaism is just a part of another religion that's happening later. It's like, dude, well, does your religion you think that's happening later, does it have a new covenant? Does it have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with power? Because if not, then that means you're just talking about something else. And, and, and try to find something better than what Jesus did, than the gifts of the Holy Spirit, than the kingdom, than the healing, than the power, than the prophecy, than the trajectory that we're on with eternal life, seated in heavenly places while here, growing, learning, getting stronger and better all the time. Find something better than that. I don't think you can. That was the whole point, that in the fullness of time, at the right time, Christ came to give everybody the same chance and give the world a chance because creation itself was waiting for people who would come in, not with selfishness, not with pain, not with fear, not with shame, but with love and with the Spirit of God to be able to make this world get replenished and taken care of in the way that God originally wanted it from people who respect creation and respect the Creator. And, and who else? nothing else can compete with that. Come on. And again, so we see this other verse here, 12. We can sort of see this idea because some people are like, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. And we use this word hated. And if there's the actual idea of a preference, preferential treatment idea here, we see. Because she's saying older, served the younger, love, hated. It was just a demonstration. And, uh, you know, this is where we just, in looking at the words, we don't read it like a five-year-old. I hate this vegetable. That's not what, not the way the word is used here, obviously. He didn't hate Esau in the same way we would say, I hate, you know, some entire person. So then verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Like, is God missing, is he messing this thing up because the whole Israel thing or whatever? He goes, no, certainly not. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whomever I'll have mercy. 
and I'll have compassion on whoever I'll have compassion. So then it's not of him who wills, who wants it, or of him who runs and tries to get it, but of God who shows mercy. So it's up to God. It's kind of like where you draw the line. It's like, okay, you got all these arguments, here's these ideas. In the end, if God said this and he wants to do it this way, then it's up to God because he, and he said it in the Bible. He said, I'll have mercy on who I want to. And the idea is, is that now it's mercy on us all. Mm. And then 17, for the scripture, he says to the Pharaoh, for this purpose, I've raised you up that I may show my power in you that my name may be declared in all the earth. He said it to Pharaoh. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills and on whom he wills, he hardens. We don't have to get into something like that, but there's ideas of like, of people's reactions and responses where God allows them into their own whatever hardening type, you know, whatever thing. Um, it's not, it's not that interesting the thing, but a lot of people have little problems with that, but we'll leave that for another time with that idea. Like, Oh, did we blame God? Dude, you read any of these chapters and you think you can blame God for anything? No chance. You know, that just shows that they don't, they're not reading the context. Verse 19, you'll say to me then, they're like the Roman, like some guy in a fictitious, fictitious argument, right? You'll say to me, well, why does he still find fault? Who's resisted his will? Like, who's, who could go, why, why is he still whatever? Who's fighting it? And he goes, but indeed, oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it? Why have you made me like this? Doesn't the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured much long suffering, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he'd prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So here a lot of people, would, they think this means, oh, God is making somebody to have wrath or to have like that or some, you know, some predestination people think, well, God made some people um, for, uh, you know, he made them for destruction. Look at, he could, and they take this metaphor and they make it literal. And that's the biggest problem. It's, I talk about this all the time. Some of the biggest errors are when people take something literal, make it metaphor, metaphor, make it literal. And the problem is, obviously, is that they feel like they need to fill in every little detail with something else when his point is, that the, if the question is, like, if God could encourage some people and harden others, then who could ever question him because he just does whatever he wants kind of thing? And then he's saying, he's bringing up this one idea of saying, look at, um, if the, you know, the, the thing that's made doesn't say to the creator person, hey, why do you do this or whatever? Because he was the created thing. So it's describing this difference. But then he's saying that if one was for honor and dishonor, and this would have been like something that's like for a fancy thing for dinner, and the other one might be to like wash your feet with or something like that. Um, but that, but that the question is here, not does he make some people for dishonor and some people for honor? The, the idea is, is that this, this discrepancy between the people's interaction with God that we just see here with the mercy and then the harden and his interaction, because what is his point? And this is the whole thing. When we look at these analogies, things, if we don't know Paul's point, what he's getting at, we're going to take all kinds of weird ideas. Now we kind of know the point. If you've been following along, it's basically this idea of how come the Gentiles get in now? How come everyone gets in? And how come some of the Jews aren't following along? That's what he's addressing here. You see that, right? So, he goes, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured much su long suffering, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now people go, look at, he prepared them for destruction. He's using this analogy again, right? And then when he times, when he times, when he makes it literal, when he describes his thing, then he says, to make riches of his glory, the vessels of mercy, which prepared beforehand for glory, even us, not just the Jews only, but the Gentiles. So here he's describing actually of Jewish believers and Gentile believers who would be these vessels of mercy compared to these ones who didn't receive it. So this isn't even like, a, you know, this is, he's already coming over here, but he's just describing God's sovereignty in decision, but not the sovereignty that some people will take it as, like God sovereignly decided to destroy this person. He sovereignly set up this new scenario that's even better for everybody. And it's, the explanation is, that some people aren't going in and some people are, has to do with their decision, their interaction with God. And then that's this idea that you, how are you going to question it? So he says then, as he says in Hosea, I'll call them my people who are not my people. 
and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. See, now you see where he was going with this, because he's talking about the sons and the people who are on the outside, and now they're in. We're still back here, right? Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. A quick work. And Isaiah said before, Unless the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed, we've become like Sodom, and we'd have been made like Gomorrah. So what do we say then, verse 30, that Gentiles who didn't pursue righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness of faith, and that even the righteousness of faith just means righteousness, this righteousness of faith, it doesn't mean even this one compared to another like we would, Um, but Israel pursuing the law of righteousness hasn't attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they didn't seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it's written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Someone walking, they stumble, they're put to shame. But they believe on him, they won't stumble, and then that. So look at what he's saying here then too. He's like, look it, there's some Jews who don't get it, and some do, and a lot do. He's like, and I'm one who is. I'm a Jew who did get it, and I made it. And here's why. Because I did it like how Abraham did, by faith. Because that's how we do it now in the new covenant. We've attained by faith, not by the works of the law. You can't get away from this old covenant, new covenant thing. And again, we're not talking about just the sacrifices of the law. We're not talking about, oh, we just take away the sacrifices and we take away the close things that we don't like and then we just keep the ones we think are moral and stuff. And it's like, that's not how a covenant works. You don't just get to line item veto the things in. It's a covenant in, covenant out. And so we have to see that. Thing. So that's what he's saying here. So look at, so he goes, look at <laughs> verse 10. I say, look at a lot, but look at, behold. That's what, that's what, if I was in Bible times, I would say, behold, behold. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel that they may be saved. For I bear witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The end of the law of righteousness. And then we're going to see somehow, and I want to slap my own self for like reading this all my life almost and never putting this together. But I'm so grateful that this, I'm not going to regret, I'm going to go forward now that we have this. This is so good. So if the old covenant, remember, like Moses asked the people, he's telling them, when your kids ask, what's this covenant for? Tell them it was righteousness to them. Tell them this will be his righteousness, that doing this covenant thing will get you this righteousness. That's why we're doing it. That's why we're doing it. But he's saying that Christ, Jesus, what he did, right, which we talked about, it's the end of the law for righteousness. To who? To the people in this new covenant, to everyone who believes. Belief is in, to get the righteousness in the new, in the law it was work. So we continue. And he says it here, verse 5, For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. Remember that verse where we're saying the just shall live by faith? This is the same idea. It doesn't mean that they will continue living in this just way or in a faithful way, though that's true. But what he's saying is this other thing is the man who does these things shall live by them. The one who obeys these covenant laws will live according to how they live the covenant laws, which is death, unfortunately, right? They're not going to live very long at all. They're going to die. So he goes, live by them. Verse six, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Now, and there's some good faith people who take this verse a little bit different, but um, it's, it's still, it's good though. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Don't say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven? that is to bring bring Christ down from above, or who will descend to the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now, this is in the middle of this phrase, so we're just going to put this here. I love that idea, word of faith. They got the doctrine thing there. But remember, this word of faith that he preaches, the word is that by faith you're saved right? That believe in Jesus. The word of faith is, faith is how you get righteous, not the law. That's specifically what what he means. That's what he means. And so, and the verse here, let's see if we can hover over it and find out. He's quoting 
Deuteronomy 30.12. Let's see if we can pull this sucker up. When he's talking about being able to fulfill this old covenant, it's not in heaven, as though one must say, he'll go to heaven and get it for us and proclaim it to us so we can obey it. Talking about the law, the covenant. And it's not across the sea, as though one must say, who'll cross to the other side and get it so we can obey it. He says, for the thing is very near you, in your mouth and in your mind, so you can do it. This is Deuteronomy 30. This is in this law, in this covenant. They're saying, here's how we did it in the old covenant. And God is saying, look it, you don't have to go up to get it. You don't have to go down the earth. It's right there in front of you. There it is. Here's the law. Do this and then you'll live. And that's what he's saying. So then Paul takes this verse and he goes, he goes, the righteousness speaks like this. Don't say in your heart who will send to heaven. And then he puts his own commentary in there. That is to bring Christ down from above, even though that's not what the original passage says. But he's saying that we don't need Christ to come again to do this or who will descend to the abyss to bring Christ up from the dead because he's already risen. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. What word? Well, the word back then was the covenant stipulations. Now it is the word of faith, which we preach. He's taking the old covenant thing, which was used to say the law is how you get righteousness. He flips the script, puts his own commentary in, and then says, nope, now it's the word of faith. The word that is coming to you, this gospel, that faith is how you get in the covenant, and that's how you get righteous, because sin is unbelief in Jesus, and righteousness because he goes to the Father, and he did. And then it continues in this other verse that we know that we love, right? That we quote. But look at the context he's saying it in. The word of faith which we preach, that, so here's the faith, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, that idea of confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's this mirroring of this, the old covenant thing of confessing and then believing. Now, some people might say, well, you have to confess all of your sins um, to a person, something like that. That is not, look, at, if someone didn't have, or, or saying they have to say it out loud. Now, you should say it out loud, but what if somebody can't talk yet? Right? They can't do, it doesn't mean they can't do this thing. The idea is, is, confessing it, which is saying faith speaks this way, is the context here, right? He's saying faith speaks in this way. He's saying confess with your mouth. This is how faith speaks. He's doing a comparison here, a little parallel, saying that that um, believe in your heart, Lord, raise him from the dead. And then, oh yeah, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. So that's a belief thing, faith, and that's how you'll be saved. And then he goes, for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, you believe, then you get the righteousness, new covenant stipulations, right? And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Again, this up here idea of saying it with the mouth, and then it's not like, so look at, here's the problem. If someone thinks, oh, well, you have to say it to confess unto salvation. Well, so you're saying that the first part of the verse where with the heart one believes to righteousness, that person isn't saved yet? No, that makes no sense. So this idea of salvation here is not the, our normal idea of being saved, right? It includes the things, obviously. And, you know, remember, there's all these, like, you know, those Venn diagrams, you got a circle here of, like, pizza and a circle here of, like, fruit salad. And where they meet is, like, a pepperoni pineapple pizza or something, right? You got things where they intersect. And sometimes some of the verses might sort of intersect, but ones that are separate that we force in somewhere else won't fit. Like, if it was, like, some kind of fish pizza or something, which I don't believe in at all. Um... So then it says, verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And that's Isaiah, Jeremiah. These are old covenant things. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, the same Lord over all, who is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's Joel again. So he's bringing all these verses. He's letting everybody, hey, this is for all. He's given these different explanations we could see of like why some Israel don't get it, why some Israel do, <laughs> do does. And, and, and he's bouncing through these ideas, but notice how rich each of these paragraphs is. He's making this specific point. And if we look at the context of these Old Testament verses, which most don't do, then it's even more beautiful. And that's something that I've been just super, you know, excited about. Now, here's another thing. Here's some verses that we might take for something else, but you'll see that well, you'll see in this context what he's talking about. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? 
So he just said, right? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So then his question is, well, hey, how are they going to call on him if they haven't believed him? And then he goes, well, and how will they believe in him if they haven't heard about him? And how will they hear unless there's a preacher, unless someone tells them? And how will they preach? How will they preach unless they're sent? And then he quotes again, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good, who bring glad tidings of good things. And then he says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. So first he's saying, how will they call him? They don't believe him. No one sent, no one whatever. How are they going to even know? What's, how is it even possible? Then, but they haven't all obeyed the gospel. Like Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, you might have heard a lot of people, how can I grow in faith? How can I get more faith? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And they translate that in their brain to say, well, if you hear the word of God a lot, then you'll have faith. Is that what that says? Is that the context? Is that, is that even what the sentence says? No. No, yeah. Read the word. The word is amazing. What it's, look at the context. He's saying, look at, why haven't they believed? Why don't they have faith? Because no one went. No one sent, did they? But he goes, but they, they were sent, but they didn't obey when it was told to them. And then he mentions, so then faith, it comes by hearing, right? And hearing when someone preaches the word of God or gives the word of God. And remember, the Bible wasn't written at this time. It's the Old Testament was, but this isn't the same way we apply it today. Now, again, I'm not trying to take this verse away from you. Read the Bible. It's the best. We're doing it right now. We're doing it right now. So we can't feel bad about that. But we don't want to take this out of context. That would be, that'd be a bummer. So what is, the, what is the thing then? Have they heard? Well, Paul says, but I say, haven't they heard? Yes, indeed, Paul says. So he's not talking about you or someone else's faith. He's still talking about Israel here, right? He's saying, but have they heard? And then 18, now he quotes some more, some more Old Testament here. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, Psalm 19, all these others, and their words to the ends of the world. And then Paul says again, but I say, didn't Israel know? First Moses said, I'll provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation, and I'll move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold, Paul says, and he says, I was found by those who didn't seek me. I was made manifest to those who didn't ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So he's asking this thing. He's like, okay, well, the God, God's word didn't fail. How come all Israel didn't get it? And he's just saying, well, because they got to do it by faith too. They got to do it by faith. And then they're saying, well, are you just making this up, Paul? He's like, no, look at God said this in all these places in the Old Testament that in this new covenant, it's everybody. And it's, and it's people that'll be foolish, people that'll make him jealous, people that didn't ask for him, didn't even know him, and he's going to show himself to them. And the very people that he's been showing himself to the entire time, they're not listening. Now, unfortunately, that still happens today and that still happens in the church. But, the only way to change it is just to listen. So let's all listen. So he continues in verse 11. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hasn't cast away his people whom he foreknew. Now remember the idea of the foreknew, like that we were talking before, the ones he foreknew and called. and pre Like these are the ones of himself in them. Or let's see what the little note says. Oh, Romans 8, 29. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life? But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 7, men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so, then, at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So he's bringing this again back to this new covenant, old covenant thing. And, and with the question being, 
like, so has God just dismissed Jewish people completely? And Paul's like, no, dude, I'm one of them. And I'm preaching to you and I'm with it. I'm in the team. I got this gospel. I heard what God wanted to do. And so then he says, look at, and here's what, and then he brings up how they do in the Old Testament when God did something before. And they said, look at, so here's what he did before. He said like this thing, when there's a chance, when, when, you know, when only maybe he thought there was only one faithful Jewish person of Israel, Israelite person, that God's like, nope, I got more. It's cool. I got you back, buddy. My run, my people. And so that's why in the same way that he's talking here is that with them and with him and with Christians and with Jews who would believe and want to hook up with God, that that, that remnant is there according to the election of grace, right? Not according to his election. Because if it was grace, okay, here's what's so funny. People take the word election. I mentioned this before. Most people don't really, I mean, if you're into the apologetics or, you know, Calvinist friends, they think election makes one person up high and God elected someone else to be that vessel made for wrath or whatever. But he's not saying just the election. It's the election of grace. That, that the choosing, that the, the being lifted into this place is of grace. That is the election. It's an election of grace. It's not an election of the person, though they would be the elect, but they're elect by grace. So then whoever gets that grace gets that election of grace. And, and, like, and, and it seems so simple when you read it in context because there's no longer, there's no way he's saying some people are cut out. His whole point is that nobody's really cut out here. Everyone can be cut in, but they have to get cut in by faith. If he was talking about who God rejected, all these people God rejected, then you could say, okay, yeah, maybe election means he's keeping people away. But the only thing that even came close to that was an analogy where it says if God chooses to have more people the whole vessel for wrath and for mercy, the idea wasn't there's a vessel for math. The idea was the vessels of mercy were us and me and you and anybody who loves him and wants him. It's so wild when you just have this optimistic new covenant kingdom perspective where God is love that you can, these verses actually kind of make sense and they kind of go together and harmonize the way it should be if one single person wrote this letter, you know what I mean? <sighs> Lord bless us all, everyone. And if by grace, it's no longer of works. The old covenant is works, but grace in the new means it's free, which is by faith. We read that already, right? He's, he has to keep saying this. I have to keep saying this. And sometimes it's preaching to ourselves, but we still can get in this mindset so easy because of the church we grew up in, because of American, because of Christian television, because these ideas where we still have this old covenant type thing kind of get on us, kind of whatever, we kind of got to worry and we think, but we can love the Old Testament portion of the Bible. And know that the Old Covenant portion, which is in there, does not define our relationship with God, but we have a better one that Jesus did. And then and then we can love the whole Bible, but then I'm like, oh yeah, no, I'm going to have a bacon sandwich later, and I'm going to have a cotton poly bamboo blend shirt, um, and I'm going to go make a garden, I'm going to put tomatoes and strawberries in there and watch. And there's nothing sinful about that. But in the Old Covenant, oh man, you know. So, we continue. What then? Verse 7, Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they shouldn't see and ears that they shouldn't hear to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled? that they should fall? Like, did God want them to fall? No, certainly not. But through their fall, they're not going along with it. To provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now there, he's quoting that verse above, right? That said like, that through what I'm doing to the other people, it would provoke them. And the old covenant, that sort of meant that when they see other nations doing good, that they would want to honor God to provoke them and inspire them to doing good and getting back to their covenant. And here, He's saying that, he's not saying, right? Some people will quote this. Well, the time of the Gentiles is now and, and God's provoking the Jewish person and then the Jews get in, then Jesus, will, it's like, that's not what the Bible says at all. It's not what he's saying here at all. It's completely unrelated. So he's saying that, that through their fall, it happened to provoke them to jealousy. Salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, if they're not doing it as riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, then how much more their fullness? You see this idea? If 
They're failing to do it. If their unbelief, if they're not doing, the ones that didn't, allowed for Gentiles to come in and all this awesomeness, how much more when some of them begin to believe, how much more full will that be? It's amazing. Verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them, for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, then the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, don't boast against the branches, but if you do boast... Remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So he's bringing this thing in because remember, he's, he is a believer, new covenant. He has love for his people. He understands, respects, and knows and has a heart for them to know God the way that he does and that the way Christ showed because that's what God wants. That's his heart coming in, his spirit speaking. And he's describing this. Hey, look, at, don't be boasting. Don't, do, don't be getting to it, you know. It's crazy. It's wild. So then he continues, you'll say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith. So that's that whole thing. He's like, look at the only reason they're broken off right now is because of unbelief. They're just, that's it. And you're only in because you believe. So there's none of this jealousy, none of this hierarchy, none of that, any whatever, right? So he's encouraging that amongst them. So then he goes, so... Don't be haughty, don't be proud, but fear. For if God didn't spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you'll also be cut off. And if they also, if they don't continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? This is like, he's like, you know, this whole idea of the Jew first, then the Gentile. Like God wanted them and then everybody and then he wants everybody. And he's saying, don't think you're something special now, right? Because they'll immediately come back in and then, and then, and then what do you got? You just got the same thing. So just love it and love them. And, then, and he's, you know, expressing his own love thing for them, but also, you know, describing, you know, because there's this, this idea if people try to disconnect too much from Old Testament in general, that then they're going to miss out on a lot of stuff. And that's true. So this is the balance here. And this is how you pray for it. And this is why you don't put some higher thing on anybody. God set the two things, the sheep and the goats are believers and unbelievers of all nations, no matter what. Verse 25, for I don't desire, brothers, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So he's saying, guys, this seems mysterious, but don't be ignorant so you don't think you're all proud. Be wise in your own opinion that the blindness in part, that right then people who didn't believe happened to them until the time that all the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles would come in. And so all of Israel, real Israel, will be saved. Now, some people think that there's a future. They take this. Is he talking about the end times? Is he talking about Revelation or something? Which isn't really about the end times. I mean, you know, like, no, he's not talking about that. He's saying that don't get all proud of yourself because they got blind now. But part of it, it happened because they had to reject Christ who came, who then allowed for the fullness of the Gentiles, all the Gentile nations to come in. This doesn't mean that there's a certain number of fullness of Gentiles. Oh, we filled up that Gentile bucket, Lord. And he's like, okay, Michael, well, now let's bring the Jews in. That's not how this thing works. That's not how the new covenant works. That's foreign to scripture. But people think that and they try to tap it into some end time scriptures that don't even match. But look what's saying here. The blindness come in part until the fullness comes in. So you can't be proud of this. You can't be all happy that they did that. You can't think you're something special because their own missing it was in this whole story of how you even got it. It's like, 
you build someone up in the spirit and then he brings them down and be like, okay, but remember to be humble and stuff, right? Because it's God, it's him, you know, but then also look at where you are. And like, we sort of need this, right? And he's brilliant, he's doing it. So then he says, look at, and so all Israel will be saved. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, you know, Zion, Jerusalem, the deliverer came, Jesus, he'll turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. And the covenant with them when he takes away their sins. Did he take away the sins? Yes. And it happened when the deliverer came, etc. All this, you'll see all these prophecies, man. If you get down with this old covenant, new covenant thing, you read all these prophecies and you'll notice things like righteousness, ending sin, making them clean. And you'll be like, oh wait, yeah, that's new covenant talk. I thought that was for 8,000 years in the future when the 10 headed beast comes out of the ocean with the tall lady. It's like, no, um, Jesus is Lord. It's so good. So then he goes, he continues on, and he's still, you know, look at, these people are understanding this, there's a strain, not just a mental strain of like figuring out this old and new covenant difference, but also the social one of what's happening in the culture. They're being chased and persecuted and stuff by these Jews. And the Jewish people think that they're heretics changing something, and the Christian people are like, no, but dude, this is kind of where God's going now. And so it's like, it's there'd be difficulty. And then Paul's sitting here right in the middle of it. He's like, I was a super awesome, like trained in Israel thing. But then also now I got like, I'm this awesome apostle with, who can write. It's like, so this is all being processed here in this idea, which is talking of the old covenant, new covenant, and, and how this fits in. So he goes, 28, con concerning the gospel, they're enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers. Now there, it's not saying these enemies for your sake. He's saying, look at when it comes to the gospel, that thing we just talked about up here, where because they were blind, that allowed Jesus to then be killed and start the new covenant, blah, blah, blah. So when it comes to that gospel, yeah, they're enemies in that way for you. But about this election, we can still love them because of who they are, because of the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, you have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown, you may also obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on them all. Now, this is this idea. When the old covenant ends, everybody is in sin. Until you believe, then you have mercy on all. And they had to be able to get that covenant out of the way because at that time, that old covenant there, that was the way to get righteous with God. When that covenant got made, that was the agreement for relationship with God. So when he's saying they're beloved for the sake of the fathers, this is this idea that, that these, the awesome prophets and Abraham and all these people who talked about this, that like, that you can't just dismiss, these aren't just, you know, people to dismiss and dislike or whatever. And if the gifts and calling of God, the gift of grace and this calling into this election of grace he doesn't take back, then they can also have it too. And so he's saying that, look, even if they've been disobedient, through the mercy shown, then you can obtain this mercy too. So he's still keeping them in check. He's like, don't get a big head about this. Don't get all weird. But remember, like, and that's what he's saying before, like, hey, okay, you got this thing, but now watch. If you think you're going to judge, you think you got it all, then you better be careful. <laughs> you know, like, and, and it's just, it's smart, and he's kind of springing it in and out. So we continue, like, um, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, who has become his counselor, who was first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Man, so he's describing all these little differences, the ins and outs, the grafting, the grace the thing. And he's like, dude, the depths of this riches and wisdom, God played this perfectly. Like it all fits. And it's this new covenant idea that the riches and the knowledge and, and his judgments and his decisions now made it possible. And so, that, and so because of that, they can't judge, they can't get ahead, they can't think they're wise in their own opinion because it's like, dude, all you did was believe, which is great and you're supposed to, but God is the one who has this rich, this knowledge that, that will bring the most into him when they truly know him. It's so good. So then, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, chapter 12, 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has told to each one a measure of faith. Now, some people will be like, I only have a measure of faith, brother. I only have a little bit. We all can believe. What's he doing in context here? He's saying, don't think you're better or higher in the context we just spoke of with Israel because he's given everybody this one measure of faith, meaning you can choose to believe or not. For as we have many members in the body, all members don't have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let's prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now remember here, he's saying that don't think you're higher than you ought to be, but you have the different gifts, you have your individuals, so do your thing because you're one body. And this is what the same thing he would be talking to the Corinthians, right? Don't be at all jealous and all this stuff. You're one body, you're one. It's God doing it, so there's no reason for this separation. Verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what's evil. Cling to what's good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in the Spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Don't be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what's good, and you will have praise from the same. For he's God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but for your conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they're God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, custom to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything except to love one another, for he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, in this case here, we understand that Knowing that Christ fulfilled the law in what he did to end it and in sin is different than this idea. But the idea of the, the commandments and the good love things that it would take to fulfill the law of what is being said in there is loving your neighbor as yourself. The not sin that hurts yourself hurts others. Um, and do this knowing the time, that now it's high time to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than we first believed. 
The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who doesn't eat, and let him not who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he'll be able to made to, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Now here, of course, the idea of eating only vegetables, not eating meat and things, this weakness, these would be ideas of things in the covenant. Don't eat these certain things. Don't eat this. They only eat this for ritual stuff or whatever. This about him being weak would just mean a weakness in the faith of the freedom and the liberty. The same thing that he spoke to um, Peter about and stuff like that. Um, and then he continues here talking about what kind of mentioned about the Sabbath and going to church on Saturday, Sunday. He says, verse 5, One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he doesn't observe it. And he who observes it, observes it to the Lord. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who doesn't eat, to the Lord he doesn't eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, here again, about eating food, not doing observing the day. He's obviously not saying, keep this particular day. Obviously. And that's what's clear besides the historical evidence and the Lord's Day was celebrated on Sunday to celebrate his resurrection from the earliest things and stuff like that. But the idea is, in this new covenant, that's not a stipulation. In the old covenant, it was a stipulation. Honor the Sabbath day, Saturday. In the new covenant, it's not. But you're still going to honor a day to the Lord, whichever one it is, right? So that's this idea where, and this is that freedom of Christ thing. And if we know that the Sabbath day, Saturday thing isn't a sin in our covenant thing, and it's freedom to worship God on any day, because look, at, they're not t Jewish people have this culture of Sabbath day, Saturday stuff. You go, there's like stores closed down, all these things. But they're going to, in Rome, they're going all over the world. God's kingdom is going all over the world. And if they happen to celebrate their days on like Monday or something, then, you know, the kingdom works there too. And you don't have to make everybody worship on the same day. You don't have to make everybody read the same version. You know what I mean? All these things. It's stuff that separates from the reality and truth of the gospel and the spiritual truth and exchanges it for some physical representation. And sometimes it's easier for the physical representation or to trust in it or to have these the traditions and stuff. And it's fine as long as it doesn't make you stumble, doesn't make you judge, and it doesn't make you think you separate from God because of it. Because if you know your covenant, then you're going to know what the covenant restricts you from doing, which is not believing, and what it allows you to do, which is to do good and grow. It's so good. So he continues, For it's written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let's not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Now notice that verse, and you know, it's, a, um, it's quoted of, Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And I talked about this in my video about all and all in the new covenant in words like every that we see. And here we see what he's saying is that what he's quoting this for is saying that each individual person lives to God what they think is holy, what they think would be right. And so you don't stumble on that. Don't mess with them. Don't try to mess it up and don't force your things or whatever. If they're doing it to God and it's good, be gentle, be humble. Don't give them something else to worry about and be offended at. But his point of quoting that verse is saying that hey, look, at they live to God. So they're going to bow before God. They're going to confess it to God, not to you or me. So, you know, for this. That's what he said. So that's the context. Now just notice the context. And also we can think whatever else we want to think. But in the context, that's what's being said. It's so good. 
14, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus. Now look, there's a lot of stuff where he's talking about the revelation he got from Jesus. He may have had more experiences besides just the initial one. No doubt when he got the Holy Spirit, getting connection, he could have been having dreams. The heaven testimony he talked about, that could have been him. He talks about getting his message from Christ, not from the apostles and stuff like that. So, you know, and somebody who knows the old covenant, who gets a little bit of light, they can then read the old covenant, all the stuff I'm talking about, all the promises about the Messiah, all the promises about the Son of Man, all these things. You can get there without saying, having listened to Matthew's story of the gospel, right? But however he did it, look what he's saying. He's convinced by the Lord Jesus there's nothing unclean of itself. Now, first of all, remember what when he was trying to convince Peter of that when God did? He brought down the unclean animals to say that the Gentiles could get saved. So Paul knows that if he's going to be God's messenger to the Gentiles, then whatever he thought about was unclean or wasn't good enough or violated this old covenant, that's no longer there anymore because you can't be a Gentile and be in the old covenant, right? That's the idea. So he's saying, look at whether or not he just figured it out or God told him himself, he's saying, I'm convinced that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything unclean, to him it's unclean. So that it's not some general big law rule thing, but you don't want to violate the person's conscience. Yet your brother is grieved because of your food and you're no longer walking in love. Don't destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Don't let my bacon eating mess you up. Don't let your vegetables mess me. Like, it's not important enough, right? It's not a big deal. Like Jesus was saying, it's now it's on the outside, man. It's what's in there. Therefore, don't let your good be spoken of as evil. Now, some people would say, well, well, hey, brother, if you do something good and people don't like it, don't let your good be spoken of as evil. What he's saying is, like, in this particular context, the good things that you know and that you have and that you believe, your freedom in Christ, don't make it trip someone else up. Don't, just watch how you say, watch how you do so that you can give them a good, you know, that you don't mess up what God is beginning in them and continuing to show them. Um, and I take that lesson. <laughs> I try. I mean, I need to more and more. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So if it's righteousness and they're righteous, who cares what they eat? Who cares what Sunday they go? If it's peace, then why you want to start a problem with them? And if it's joy, hey, I'm happy, more meat for me, you know? And it's in the Holy Spirit through which we're connected. So, you know, that verse is a lot about the kingdom, but we see the context here. It's about saying, look, at since the kingdom is like this, then any of these little trials and troubles and stumbles and problems and stuff, they're not a kingdom thing, man. They're like a personal thing. So chill out on that if it's going to give someone an owie, a brain owie or an emotional owie, you know? For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. If you serve Christ in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, it's acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let's pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it's evil for the man who eats with offense. It's good neither to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who doesn't condemn himself in what he approves. That's a big thing of the conscience. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not of faith is sin. Now, we'll take this, and some people would have to, to apply this in other places. And we understand kind of, you know, what it means. Because some people are like, well, here's a sin in the new covenant, brother. No, well, if it's even a general sin or just meaning that this is the place where sin is, it's, if it's not in faith, and in this case, we're talking about the new covenant where faith is how you get in, so all things are legal and lawful, you know, that, or the old covenant, if that other person isn't in faith doing it, then to them, they are violating their own conscience, and that would be a sin to them. Is it a covenant sin? No, there's only one covenant sin, right? But our regular personal sins have an effect on us, right? And life, and we don't want to do that. So that's kind of the whole point. So whatever's not from faith is sin. He's saying, like, if that person doubts and is condemned when they eat, and they're like, oh, should I do this? I don't know if I should do this. Then that's probably violating their own conscience and they'd be offended. So don't do that. It's awesome. So remember, like, and it's interesting. We see the whole, remember his story of the progression, 
of what he's saying, right? He gets a man, gets a covenant, talks about the spirit, talks about how Israel's awesome, talks about what they need to do, talks about how he loves them, talks about still keeping the covenant separate, right? Because once we get this idea of the new and old covenant, there's a lot of ideas that have been brought into our church where we have to now look differently as different of people individually and separate that from some Old Testament ideas where certain nations were bad and certain nations were good. And then he's going here into this daily life stuff, right? We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ didn't please himself, but as it's written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we get our little therefore. Therefore, receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So, you know, receiving one another, blessing these Jewish people, there were some persecution, some didn't know, some were weak, some were Christians, some were in this transition, right? They're still learning and growing in this. And he's saying if Jesus became a servant for them so they could know the truth, then to confirm the promises that he made through the prophets, through these guys to them, and then for uh, the Gentiles to come in to glorify God for his mercy on the Gentiles, on the ones who were not his people, who he has declared mercy, as it's written. He brings up some more good Old Testament verses here. For this reason, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing your name. That's 2 Samuel and Psalms. And again, he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And that's from Deuteronomy 32, 43. Mm, love me some Deuteronomy 32. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. That's Psalm 117. And again, Isaiah says in Psalm, Isaiah 11, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles will hope. Hmm. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at with those things. He's talking to these Gentile folks and with these promises of who they are, getting them in that mindset, in that right place, that the God of hope fills with joy and peace and faith so that they can abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm, that's good. Chapter 15, verse 14. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brothers, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able, to, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I've written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you, because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me, in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient, in mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But, that, but as it's written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. Mm. I just love his heart. Don't you see his heart here? Oh my goodness. For this reason, I've also been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. 
For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make certain contributions for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles had been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now he's going to finish up with his, the traditional greetings at the end of a letter. Back then, the epistles. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Kenchkria, <laughs> that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many, and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that's in their house. Greet my beloved Apennidas, who is the firstfruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. And Stachys, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Trophina and Trophosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philoglius and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Mwah. The churches of Christ greet you. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what's good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the treasure of the city, greets you, and Cordus, a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith, to God alone, alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Mm. The revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. Now, later we read in Colossians, the mystery is Christ in you by the Spirit, which only happens in the New Covenant. And the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations for obedience to the faith. All nations is all. That's a New Covenant thing, not old. And obedience by faith is how we get into this New Covenant. Thanks for being here with me today. You can see it got a little warm in here. I turned off the air conditioning because didn't want it to make too much noise. And now I have a pinkish hue. But it's been so fun. Thank you for being here. If you have any questions, any comments, any criticisms, please leave them in the comments. If you made it this far, go ahead and type a number 37 in the thing 
and I'll know. And if not, then I'll know you didn't. How dare you not get this far in the video? Just kidding. Love you. The Lord loves you. Check out the website. What's up to the members? Appreciate you guys. Thanks for supporting the channel. Patreon members, I love you. God bless you all. We will see you next time. Let me know what book you want to do next. I'm thinking Ephesians or maybe some other Corinthians. But mm, this is good. Isn't this good? Love y'all. We'll see you next time.